Afternoon, everyone, and thank you for coming to this talk to hear about my research that I've been doing for something called the Headley Fellowship. I've had a lot of fun doing this research, and I hope you find it as interesting as I do. I'll start just by giving a bit of a background to what the fellowship is. So it's a curatorial fellowship funded by Art Fund. It encourages museum projects to bring wider engagement and understanding to significant collections held in museums all across the UK. The Headley Fellowship aims to give curators the time and resource to work on a focused area of a collection, so deepening our understanding of that collection and the museum, and then sharing it not only with the museum but the wider sector. And indeed, I have to meet various quite strict outcomes as part of this fellowship, and this talk is one of them, which fits wonderfully. So the scheme works by giving curators time away from their day-to-day -day job and to embark on a period of research and development. The fellowship has meant that I've been working part-time, and the backfill of my post has been ably filled by Jane Gallagher, who will be doing your next talk. But the overall aim of the programme is to develop and preserve specialist curatorial skills and enable the knowledge to be shared as widely as possible. I wasn't the only curator to receive this fellowship. You can see there I am on a PR photo with the three other curators that were awarded them of that year. So what is my project? My project is to catalogue, clean, and rehouse, and then research a part of the archival collection. The collection contains some 750 orders undertaken by the Colbertdale Company Ironworks in the late 19th to the early 20th century. In the 1980s, I believe, a basic listing was done of these orders, but they've not been catalogued or looked at further or ever researched. The orders are stored in 26 boxes, of which you can see some here. The orders contain original draftsman's drawings, blueprints, costings, correspondence on items largely ornamental and architectural ironwork. And you can see some of the examples here. The museum knows very little about the actual output of the Colbradale Company at this period, who the clients were, the costings of the ironwork, the construction, and where the orders went. We know of some examples being sent abroad, but where were they actually going, and how many are still in situ? So the collection is not just a fantastic design archive, but it's a great archive of our built heritage. Another area I wanted to look into in this project was looking at that of social history. I wanted to understand a bit more about the actual workers who were involved in the orders, so the draftsmen, the moulders, the fitters. And then on top of that, it's also interesting to view this collection in the wider context of the Colbertdale Company. So the last major expansion of Colbertdale was around 1900 with new foundries and workshops and offices being built. But moving on into the early years of the 20th century, there was a downturn in the iron trade. And one employee at the works recorded short time working, which basically means staff worked shorter hours, followed by 25 foremen and staff being fired, well, being laid off, and then a further 15 moulders being thrown out of work due to the lack of work at the time. The workmen who remained were kept on at a reduced wage. Then with the end of the Great War, there's a period of great change and depression across the country, which in some way resulted with Colbertdale being absorbed by an alliance of iron founding companies, and then of course allied iron founders in 1929. So the orders give an insight into what was actually being made at this time, and I should mention it's just a small proportion of what would have been made at the peak in the 1850s in term, terms of the ornamental work. And we know that in the middle of the 19th century, Colbertdale was thought to be the largest ironworks in the world, employing between 3,000 and 4,000 men. So the collection contains so many orders, 
So I've just picked out a few key ones to look at, some of which you will recognise and some which may be a surprise. I sh should add that I've had a lot of help from a collections volunteer called Rob, who has been steadfastly working his way through the boxes with me. We've catalogued around 400 orders, which equates to nearly 2,000 individual items. So I'm going to start with one that hopefully everyone will re recognise, and these are still in situ in Colebrookdale today. These are the Jubilee lamp posts. They can be found on Dale Road and Wellington Road. They were produced for Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee in 1897, and they were ordered by the Colbertdale Jubilee Committee. Here you can see the design for the inscription shield, which just reads, erected by public subscription to commemorate the Diamond Jubilee of Her Majesty Queen Victoria in 1897. So the finding of this order was enormously helpful in terms of the Queen's recent Platinum Jubilee, and we displayed these orders as part of a display at Colbertdale to celebrate the Platinum Jubilee. There was also this note attached to the drawing for the inscription shield. I'll just read it out for you. It says, W. Jones, please have the letters marked out for the enclosed shield for CBD, and I will get the chasing shop to touch them up. Signed, G. W. S. in 1897. So I mentioned researching the workmen behind the orders, and here immediately we have two. And they both feature in this photograph. It's a photograph taken of the foreman and managers in 1901. And in fact, many of the workmen mentioned in the orders that I'm working on are in this photograph, which is enormously helpful. The chap who wrote the note he was sitting at the front on the left. That is George Shepherd. Now, he was born in 1856 in Dorley and for many years was the art manager at Colbrookdale. He attended the School of Art, where he won numerous prizes for his work, and later on, he also taught at the School of Art. When he died, which was in 1913, apparently the works shut at 1 p.m. for the whole afternoon, so he was a very well-respected character. The chap on the right is, that's the W. Jones, that's Walter John Jones, again born in Colbrookdale. His father was a pattern maker for the company, and Jones began working at Colbrookdale also as a pattern maker before becoming a manager. Later in the 20th century, his family emigrated to Canada, and I've been in contact with his great-grandson, who lives in Ontario. So not only do we have the original drawings, we know who ordered the lamps, as well as the workmen involved, and they're still in situ. This is quite an unassuming little order for something not that exciting. It's for an underground stove for a church. It was ordered in 1914 by George Wilcox, who was a plumber and painter who lived on the wharfage. But what I like about this one is that Edwin Wilcox great-grandson, a George, no, a Rob Wilcox. He is not only a plumber, but he works with the museum today. So it's a nice direct link. One of the most common orders was for railing. This order was from 1904, and it's for balcony railing for the Lady Forrester Convalescent Home in Landudno. Lady Forrester was married to George Weald Forrester. He was a member of parliament for Wenlock for 46 years. And Lady Forrester's will left a legacy to build both a cottage hospital, that's at Much Wenlock, and this convalescent home at Land Dudno. The architect who worked with Colbrookdale for this balcony railing was someone called Edward Ianson. And it turns out he is from a di dynasty of architects. His father was president of the Royal Institute of British Architects. So just a little snippet into the type of people they were working with. This is the home as seen around 1910. The railing, hopefully you can make it out, it's where the people are standing on the left-hand side of the image. And today, the railing is still in situ. It's the white railing you can just see again on the left. The home 
is now a state-of-the-art centre for blind and vision impaired ex-servicemen and women. It's run by Blind Veterans UK. And again, what's quite nice with the home is that the reason the charity chose this one is because it's a large building with extensive ground so you can build safe pathways for the ex-servicemen. But I think Lady Forrester would be happy it's still being used in such a nice way. Another order, this again should be recognisable. This is a staircase ordered by the engineering department at Colbradale. So they seem to also record when they were doing work internally. It's the staircase up to the former engineering department drawing office, which is where education and conference and banqueting now have their offices. This order has already proved helpful as we have to do some work on the staircases, so I could produce the original drawing. And the drawing is also dated 1904. We've never had a certain date for the building of these head offices. We've just said early, late 19th, early 20th century, but now at least we can say, well, it's, it's definitely 1904, if not a year before or after, which is rather nice. This is a very interesting order. It's for two spiral staircases. It's dated 1903. At the top of the blueprint, you might be able to make out that it, there's a note saying that the staircases are for shipment abroad. The staircases were ordered by a firm called Takata & Co. And on looking this company up, it turned out that they were Japanese contractors and engineers based in Osaka. Osaka, sorry. And they were known for ordering ships on behalf of Japanese owners and for the Eastern trade. Takata and Co. were connected with the Kawasaki Dockyard in Japan, which was one of the largest ship building yards in the world at the time. So there's a high possibility that these staircases were sent to Japan. And if so, this is the first time we've heard of items being exported there. So we know Colbertdale exported widely, but this is the first time we've heard of anything going to Japan. Another great part of this order is that it includes detailed timeframes of what would be made and when. These timeframes seem to be called something, well, something called promise sheets. You can see one here and I've put the information into a table so you can read it a bit more easily. And hopefully you can see that each stage of the process of making the staircase is noted and how long it will take. So the work, of course, starts in the pattern shop where the pattern makers, they have two weeks to make the pattern for the staircases. The iron patterns are subsequently made followed by the molding, which takes three weeks. The fitters have the longest length of time. They have nine weeks including the week the work is, works is closed at Christmas. And painting and packing only takes one week. So the whole operation of making these two staircases takes 14 weeks, which is quite interesting to know. Not sure what to do with that information just yet, but very helpful. So not only did we have the promise sheet in this order, we had this Gantt-style chart. So Gantt... Gantt charts, they're a type of chart that illustrates a project schedule. They were named after Henry Gantt, who designed a chart around, such a chart, around 1912. So this order's from 1903, so I was thinking, what is going on here? Well, I learned that the first type of Gantt chart was actually developed in 1896 by a Polish engineer who ran a steelworks in Poland. So it makes me wonder, were Colbrookdale in touch with this Polish steelworks? Or had the iron working industry already adopted it very quickly? But certainly, Colbrookdale took it up as a helpful organisational chart. Now we go back to this photograph. And we're still on the staircases order. It had so much information in it. On the progress sheet... Every section is detailed in terms of who was responsible for the process, which workers. And five of the workers are directly referred to in this order. And again, they all feature in this photograph. The first chap I'd like to focus on, again on the front row, so of notable importance, 
And this is James Vellacott Rawl. So James Rawl was born in Bristol in 1857. He worked for the Colbertdale Company for 34 years. 12 of, of them were spent at the Bristol office before he came up to the Dale. He was a clerk for many years and then a storekeeper here. Only three years after the order of the staircases, Rawl was charged with embezzlement. And according to Charles Peskin, our local um, diarist, in 1906, Rawl was dismissed at a minute's notice from the works. Now, I can't take full credit for all of this research. A lot of it was done by my colleague, Joe Smith. But to fill you in on the full story, Rawl was the storekeeper here, so in charge of the stores. He had an annual salary of £125. As store, storekeeper, Rawl could sell coal or iron or any goods in the stores and he would receive cash for those items. Now, it was part of his job to note down those transactions and give them to the cashier every evening. But it transpired that he had been selling goods and pocketing the money and taking no note of the transaction. He did this over numerous years, and the embezzlement ran to a large amount at that time of £190. He was a respected member of the community, and during the court case, the prosecution had not a bad word to say about his character, apart from the embezzlement. Rawls' defendant made a strong plea for leniency on the behalf of Rawl. He said he was a man of some education and had been working at Colbertdale for 34 years. And during all that time, apart from present offences, nothing was known against his character. He was afraid there was no doubt the prisoner had given away to drink and had fallen into temptation, for he had been living above his income. On pronouncing the sentence, the judge addressed Rawl, saying that it was not the amount he had embezzled so much as the long course of the prisoner's dishonesty. He was a man of some position and trust at Colbertdale, and his example for good or for evil could not fail to affect the younger servants. The case was a serious one, and Rawl ended up going to prison for 12 months with hard labour. After completing his hard labour, and spending a brief time in Warwickshire, he emigrated to Canada and started a new life out there as a farmer. His family still live there today. The other chap I'd like to mention is Abraham Chilton. He is possibly the most mentioned or, um, person in the orders. He was born in Little Wenlock in 1837, the son of an iron roller. And at the time of this photograph, he was foreman fitter, so he would have worked to assemble the castings together. And according to an oral history we have in the archive, he was a very notorious character. The image of the staircase on the left, I think that photograph was actually taken in Chilton's workshop. And that's around where the Museum of Iron Car Park is now. One area I haven't looked into at all yet, but I think it's quite interesting to think of the process of these orders in terms of the idea in the drawing office, moving through to the pattern shops, the moulding shops, to the fitters, then the painters and the packers, to capture that physical journey across this site. And that's just an image of the upper works where all these orders were being completed. Now, onto a famous name, so it's all relative. But this order is dated 1904 for balusters for a house, and it was ordered by Lewis Foreman Day. So he was a British decorative artist, an industrial designer, and an important figure in the arts and crafts movement. The balusters were, were for a rather grand home on Gordon Square in London, which is very close to the British Museum. So you can see the blueprint that shows the design of the balusters. There's a note in the middle where you can see Lewis's name, and that's a photograph of the house. I don't know if they're still in situ. I like to think they are. So Day ordered the balusters from 
Colbert Dell's London showroom, which at this time was on Queen Victoria Street, so not far from London Bridge. And in the order, there's a letter from the London showroom to the Colbert Dell works detailing that Mr. Day would like the pattern to be something like his design for railing. Please send us one or two rough sketches for his approval. So it's suggested that Day, if not design the balusters himself, at least discussed what they would look like. And again, first time we've heard of Lewis F. Day working with Colbert Dale. And in terms of what else was being made, I've had a lot of fun with data. So I took a sample of 100 orders, again, all during the period of late 19th to early 20th century. And the items being made include verandas, ranges, windows, and vases. As you might be able to see, the most popular item was tomb railing, and that largely went to Wales. Again, not sure why. But after tomb railing, gratings were the most popular, followed by columns and then lamp posts. Some of the more unusual or notable orders I've not included in this sample include an order for 144 jug handles, railings for underground conveniences, fireplaces for an asylum, windows and stable fittings for breweries, and a conservatory for a TB hospital. Now, where were things being sent? By and large, England, that's the orange column. Although nearly 30% was sent to Wales, that's the green, and only 2% to Scotland, which makes sense as they had their own very successful foundries. I've mentioned the Japanese order, but so far out of the 400 I've looked at, that's the only international one. When going through the orders, I realized that there was one reoccurring word on almost every order, which is that of urgent, to the point where it seemed almost pointless writing it, although some are noted as very urgent, as opposed to urgent. This was the most urgent order I found. It's for nine cast iron spandrels, ordered in 1906 by Gardiner and Sons. They were an ironworks in Bristol. The company is still in existence today, and they frequently ordered items from Colbertdale, and I'm assuming they were used to late delivery. So as for the nine cast iron spandrels, they were wanted in 14 days' time, and if Colbertdale did not meet the deadline, they would no longer have the custom. I'm happy to report that they did meet the deadline and continued to order things through Colbertdale. There's also been some really nice surprises of finding items still in situ that we didn't know about. This is Portland Terrace in London. It's a rather grand mansion, uh, but it's blocks of apartments, and it looks out across Regent's Park. Colbertdale made the balcony railing for the building which you might just be able to make out closer to the top of the building. It was ordered in 1904 by an architect. Hopefully you can see the railing a bit more closely there. It's got this really lovely Art Nouveau design to it. I snooped on a property site to see what an apartment was like. There are still a lot of original features, such as fireplaces, but I don't know if Colbert Dell made those or not. But what I can say is... The apartments cost around three million, if you wanted to know. I thought it was quite interesting. Another really nice in situ item is this drinking fountain, ordered in 1909 from an architect in Tony Pandy, the Rhonda Valley. Sadly, the only part of the order we have is this blueprint. It is heavily crumpled, which is why you've got a bit of a strange angle there. But what I really like is that we have a glass plate negative of this item in the collection. So you can see it here, photographed, before being dispatched. It's a memorial fountain commemorating someone called Archibald Hood. He was a Scotsman who founded the Glamorgan Collieries. The fountain has these lovely three basins and water, well, lion's heads spout the water into the basins. There's a drinking cup suspended on a chain at each basin. 
Then the fountain also has a trough at ground level for dogs and then a large trough for horses and cattle. The top of the fountain has a statue of a water carrier and she's holding a glass lamp atop a water jug. This is the fountain in situ in the square in the 19th, oh, sorry, 20th century, and then all that is left of it as seen today. Apparently in 1965, someone drove into the fountain and the statue was damaged, the arms were broken. The statue was repaired, no one knows what happened to the actual drinking fountain, and the statue can now be found in a park near the town hall in Tony Pandy. So it's nice, at least an element of it is still here. More often than not, things are no longer in situ. On the left, you can just about make out an iron porch, and that was made for the Welsh Harp Hotel in Cardiff, but hotel long gone. And on the right-hand side, you've got this lovely run of railing. That was outside Hanley Cemetery in Stoke, but long gone. Another item that is no longer in situ, but I just think is a really nice decorative piece. It's a veranda for a private residence in Wales. Now, this house was built at the end of the 18th century to designs by John Nash. And the same family lived on this site for hundreds of years. The cast iron veranda was obviously a later addition. It was added in 1910. And so you can see the order on one side and on the other, hopefully you can make out that veranda just behind the chap. The house was demolished in the later 20th century. And, yep, yeah, sorry, that was there, just demolished and no longer in existence. So I thought let's just also have a look at who was doing the ordering. I've mentioned a few of the companies, but here's a list of the clients. The most frequent orders were from ironmongers, such as this one shown here, which is Macintosh and Sons, and ironmongers in Cambridge. I've included also F and C Osler. They ordered several items, uh, largely lamp pillars, as F and C Osler, they were the leading British glassmaking company in the 19th century, so they presumably needed Colbertdell to provide the lamp pillars. Other, in clients, in, other clients include sculptors, blacksmiths, architects, and district councils. This is an order for a lamp pillar, and it was ordered by David King and Sons, who owned a renowned ironworks in Glasgow, specialising in ornamental and architectural ironwork. So I'm not quite sure why they came to Colbertdale for this one. Another interesting find has been this drinking fountain, dated 1901 and ordered by an iron merchant, merchant called John Knox & Co. Colbert Dare were specifically asked not to put their name on this drinking fountain, but to put the name of John Knox & Co. So it makes, uh, just put, brings it into another level in terms of determining what is Colbert Dale and what isn't if their name is not on products. I'll just touch on this briefly, but through the fellowship, I've been able to undertake research trips. At the moment, it's mainly taken me to Scotland to look at the former foundries and ironworks there. In the 19th century, there were hundreds of foundries in Scotland. In Glasgow alone, there were around 210 foundries in 1900. I've been focusing on a few of these key foundries. One of them is the Lion Foundry in Kirk and Tillock. They are famous for their telephone boxes and post boxes. And they're also very similar to Colbertdale in terms of what their archive and collection include. Very similar to us. I've also been looking at the Caron Company Ironworks. They were established in 1759 and the earliest work workers had been poached from Colbertdale to train the local workforce. Then finally, the Falkirk Ironworks. Again, another foundry very similar to Colbertdale. There are more similarities than differences between the different ironworks. 
This is a photograph of a moulding shop at Falkirk, but it could have just as easily been taken at Colbrookdale, and it looks just like our photographs of the Colbrookdale moulding shops in our archive. We even know of employees moving between different ironworks. Several workers from Falkirk came to Colbrookdale. There is a stark difference, and that is what is left of the sites today. That's the main difference. In Scotland, it seems to be their largely housing and industrial estates. So when I was in Scotland, I visited the site of the former Carron Ironworks. Here you can see it in its heyday, and hopefully the sheer scale of it. The Carron Company also laid claim to being the largest ironworks, and they made domestic items, just like flat irons, cookers, although most famously a type of cannon which was used by Wellington at Waterloo. The company even had its own fleet of steamships, so it was an enormous enterprise. If you can see just at the bottom, there's that row of housing and there is a clock tower at the front. I just want to highlight that because that's all that's left of the site, just the clock tower, which was added in the 19th century. The boundary wall remains, so you can walk around the entire site. And then that's my photograph looking in of what is left of the works. I have a mentor for the fellowship, and he took me around what's left of the site. And he explained, essentially, there's no pride in ironworking at the moment. And it's seen as a dirty subject that people do not want to be associated with, even now which perhaps explains why the sites are housing, housing estates and industrial sites today. So at this point, I'll end my talk. Hopefully it's given you a bit of an insight into Colbrookdale at this date, what was being made, where it was going, and if it's still in situ. These are some of my finished boxes, which are very pleasing to have, everything's housed and catalogued wonderfully. But at this point, I feel like I've only really touched the surface of the information that can be yielded from this archive. But I hope by the end of the fellowship, I'll be able to bring to light more stories and understanding of this collection. Thank you. As you say, it really does reveal an insight that we perhaps had not been aware of. Mm -hmm. I mean, from the point of view of Colbertdale, with getting these orders, was this them approaching customers or customers approaching Colbertdale? I think customers approaching Colbertdale, and a lot of it came through the London showroom. Right. So clients, anyone who wanted to buy anything, would go to the showroom, order from the catalogue, flick through, yeah. then the order would come up here. Yep. Fantastic. Are there any questions? Yes. How many of the original 20 old boxes have you managed to work through? That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> so there were um, half, so probably about 13. Every box is labelled A to, A to Z, and each order has a prefix of A to Z, which I think is due to geographical location. But I'm not quite sure. I don't know if anyone's heard of a prefix used for orders, if it's a standard type of thing, but I think it's location. But yes, halfway through. How much longer do you have? Um, <laughs> October. But I've, be I've become much more speedy at cataloguing. Thanks. Any other Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah. so everything was assembled here first, checked, then taken apart, packed and sent. So these were flat packers before IKEA? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure how big the boxes were. <laughs> and there weren't screws left over there. Yeah. Uh, anyone else? Do you have a, also have the names of each of the 
we do. I wouldn't have been able to do it if someone hadn't labelled it. Um, that photograph came in through the Colbert Dale Archive Association, so it's quite an early object in the archives. So I think whoever donated it knew who every single person was, which is yeah, hugely helpful. Mm. Colbert Dale? Yes. No. So catalogues weren't really a thing until maybe mid to late 18th century. It was quite a new thing. We're used to Argos now, but at the time. And iron workers took it up quite quickly because it was obviously heavy and difficult to move and store items. So it's much easier ordering an item from a catalogue than it being made. And also due to the precision casting, it meant that the item you'd see in the catalogue would be the item you would get. And they developed, I mean, they're quite basic in the late 18th century, but by the middle of the 19th, the catalogues are really specialised and really expensive to buy as well. And they were sent out to ironmongers and there are blank sheets in some of them, so they'd update by sending new sheets through to the ironmongers. You could order whatever you wanted. You could commission items, or you could say, I like this sculpture, but I want it you know, in three foot rather than one. They, it would be a higher cost, but they would do anything, I think, whatever they could. I know that um, they used to make sugar pans. Yes. To the, yeah. um, the West Indies. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. I didn't see them. I haven't seen sugar pans in the catalogues we have, but Colbert Dale was sending them out quite early to the West Indies. I gave the pictures to Barry Trinder. Oh, okay. I don't know where they are now. Oh. With him, probably. Okay, well, that's, that's good to know. <laughs> but I have seen one in Scotland, actually. Uh, Falkirk have a sugar pan in their collection, and it's about 10 foot in diameter. It's enormous. Any other questions? Well, I don't think it's been selected because of some of the stuff I wouldn't say is particularly special. Um, but I know that, I believe that the Colbert Dale Company's photographer, so they had a, their own photographer, and he developed things like the blueprints as well as taking photographs of all the products. He looked after all of these orders and blueprints and he had a, his own cataloguing system, which I'm sort of working through. And I think there doesn't seem to have been any selective process, but I know that there are orders missing. Not everything is in those boxes. Um, so we know fountains were being made at this time. There's the Peacock Fountain in Christchurch in New Zealand, made 1909, so that should be in these orders, but it's not there. It's interesting that you said it was an item that was made and they weren't allowed to put their name on it. Yeah. Yes. There are, there's so many. I mean, I would love to connect. So we have all the printing blocks that we use to make the catalogues. So you could connect printing block to item, possibly to catalog. I mean, that would be really interesting to look into. No, sadly not. There seems to be no archive material anywhere on Christopher Dresser. I'm afraid not. Not even the V&A have anything in their archives either with the relationship between Christopher Dresser and Colbert Dale. So he worked for them or with them for about 20 years. So I don't know where that correspondence is, sadly. Again, the, the scholarship that you're on, the other people working for the, yes. the members, 
Do you ever get together or have correspondence? <laughs> we were meant to meet this week in Cambridge, but the train oh, strike yes. threw <laughs> <laughs> that off. I have met them on Zoom, but um, it's been interesting hearing about their projects, which are wildly different. Yeah. Are there similarities in terms of frustrations, I suppose there must be? Yeah. Well, we were all due to start in 2020. So, obviously, I started, what, last year. Another one did manage to finish during COVID. One of them started then caught long COVID and has not since been able to get back to work. Gosh. And one of them's just been able, like me, to start later on. So, we've had... It's made it difficult doing the research yeah. and visiting places. Yeah. But nonetheless, I think we're yeah. entirely grateful to Headley Scholarship and yeah. indeed to yourself for taking on this. And it's opened up another dimension to Colbertdale and we know a little bit more now than we did before. Yes. So it's great. Oh, and actually before I forget, if anyone would like to see the actual orders, I'll be holding workshops on the 17th and 18th of September in the Colbertdale Gallery and anyone can just pop in and see it. It's also during the weekend of the Heritage Open Days. Can I ask you again? Our thanks to Georgina for her time. Thank you. Thank you.